just hide behind my cat. Hi, everyone. Looks like we're getting some people loaded in. Yeah, welcome, everyone. Oh, hi, Darcy. Lorelai, Cassie. Hi, Cassie. If you're coming for a VTS Academy, let us know what Academy you are a member of. If you want to tell us where you're coming from too, that'd be great. But we'd love to know what VTS you're coming from. And if you're not from a VTS, welcome. You are absolutely welcome as well. AVST, behavior. Oh, they're all coming in. Yeah. Christian, <laughs> Christian AVST, Derm. AVST, Derm. Control medicine. Aim vet. Nice. Anesthesia, 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 lab animal medicine. No problems, Wendy. We, we hadn't said anything yet. So APVRT, AVTAA. Awesome. A bunch from nutrition being well, represented just, here. Get this started <laughs> here. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the NAFTA webinar tonight. Um, our Topic tonight is question writing, avoiding the common mistakes that can derail your assessment. Um, our speaker tonight is Dr. Bernard Hansen, and we also have Vicki O'Grain and Linda Murrell with us who will be handling the Q&A and doing the introductions for everything tonight. Um, everyone is muted. If you have any questions, um, I'm sure Vicki and Linda will either interrupt or the questions can be answered at the end, but it's real important if you can put your question in the Q&A, because if they get in the chat, they can get lost in the chat if everybody's chatting and talking to each other. So if you really do have a question, make sure you put it in the Q&A. So I'm going to turn it over to um, Linda and Vicki, and they're going to take it off and we'll get this all started tonight. Hi, um, I'll go ahead and start and then I'll turn it over to Linda. So I am Vicki O'Grain. I'm the CE chair and the CVTS chair elect. I'm also a VTS in nutrition. And it is our extreme pleasure to be able to bring you this uh, webinar series that we've been doing. So this is the second one. If you missed the first one, it was recorded. So you would be able to watch it. This, is, this one is gonna be on question writing 101. So Linda, you wanna take it away to introduce our amazing speaker? Yes. For those of you who missed the first one, uh, like Vicki said, go to the recording. It was really good. It, Dr. Bernie Hansen, who uh, has his DBM from Purdue and then has went on to get his uh, diplomat status at ACVIM in internal medicine and also another one because, you know, one's not enough. He has his uh, emergency and critical care diplomat status also. Yeah. So he is currently the associate professor in the Department of Clinical Sciences at the North Carolina State University College of Veterinary Medicine. And he has served as either the director or co-director of the Companion Animal Intensive Care Unit since 1988. And his primary clinical and research interests include critical care and recognition and treatment of pain. And he's got some hobbies. Uh, every now and then a picture will came in on the last meet, uh, meeting. I think we had a bike, bicycle picture, um, bicycling, farming, and astronomy also. So uh, very new age man here with a lot of good, great interests. And he is going to talk to us about how to write these test questions, the pesky test questions that we all struggle with writing. <laughs> So look, thank you, Dr. Bernie. All right, thanks, Linda. And uh, Linda and Vicki, uh, uh, as you said, feel free to stop me at any point where someone has a question that I can address. Um, it might be better to do it at the moment than, than uh, wait for the end if it's uh, appropriate. Um, so uh, my background also includes um, being kind of a permanent member of the exam committee for the Critical Care College. I started in the early 90s 
had a bit of a hiatus when I was on the uh, um, executive board um, uh, for the organization in the late 90s and then got back into the committee uh, when I saw they were struggling with uh, uh, getting the exam into electronic format. And I kind of took over the administration of the exam uh, on an electronic uh, testing platform. And in the process of that, started editing questions and making myself more knowledgeable about question writing. So I served as an editor. and I'm kind of the final editor for the exam questions. And also um, learned a lot about uh, the psychometrics of examining and setting um, uh, the standard for the uh, pass point and validating the exam. So I do all the exam analysis uh, for the college and a, a couple of other organizations too. Last time um, I went through kind of an overview of the credential exam process and included everything on this list. Um, today I'm going to focus on one particular item and that is creation of the items or questions, uh, the process of writing, editing, and reviewing them. Uh, and uh, as I think uh, Linda and others said, uh, the last session we recorded, I went into a little bit about the process leading up to uh, item creation, then exam development, setting the pass point, uh, administering the exam, and then um, uh, doing a post-mortem on the exam and uh, 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 doing preliminary scoring and then adjusting the final score based on exam performance as well as candidate performance. I used this um, uh, graphic last time as well, and just to remind us that um, the we're trying to assess the competency of candidates who are at least minim, minimally qualified to be a member of the organization and the domain of knowledge that they uh, need to know for competency is the kind of the construct or design of the, the tasks uh, that you perform as a specialist. And that's arrived at ideally by uh, an organization-wide task analysis uh, to determine who is doing what uh, within the, the realm of the organization and what percentage of time is spent on critical tasks. So getting a, ideally an objective measure like that of uh, what you do as a member of an organization and the exam uh, needs to try to assess competency at those critical tasks. And obviously an exam can't measure every last skill that's necessary for an organization. So it samples uh, and hopefully gets a valid sample of the tasks that are important to the organization. So where the exam overlaps the, the construct of the organization, that's a valid exam. And things that are on the exam that aren't part of the the uh, job description for a specialist is basically contamination that doesn't help the candidate and it doesn't help you. Um, and anything that's important that's not assessed on the exam is a, basically a deficiency of the exam. So the ideal exam would sample a broad uh, a range of elements of the jobs that you do as a, as a specialty organization and give a meaningful representation of uh, your professional uh, life. And to that end, uh, each item on the exam needs to kind of align with um, uh, the, the blueprint that you develop based on the task analysis or other assessment of what you do as an organization. Um, so a lot of effort needs to go into deciding what you're going to ask about, like the, the things that are key to being a successful member of the VTS uh, or any other organization. The exam committee also needs to decide what kind of mix of cognitive skills need to be tested. Um, uh, and that depends a little bit on who you are and, and, and the jobs that you do. And also um, the relative importance of different levels of cognitive, cognitive function uh, that uh, make up a, a working day for members of the academy. Um, and most people uh, refer to either Bloom's taxonomy of educational objectives, or there's a few other uh, psychometric scales like this that try to categorize um, essential skills or objectives for skills uh, that are important in any educational process, including uh, becoming trained as a member of a specialty. And uh, some folks further break those down into cognitive skills 
effective skills and psychomotor skills. Um, for us, we don't really test effective skills. Um, these are things that, that make somebody a valued colleague uh, and a workmate um, and a contributor to an organization. They're really hard to test for outside of maybe a job interview. And as you know, we always do a poor job at job interviews. Um, uh, but these are really things that, that uh, make up the, the contributions to a working team. And they're really kind of hard to test for and uh, not necessarily appropriate things to test for, uh, for a specialty organization looking for critical skills. Psychomotor tests are largely assessed um, by methods other than exams. So these are things that most of you, I suspect, have as part of your credentialing process. And it wouldn't surprise me if a number of the VTS organizations have kind of checkoff lists uh, where uh, folks need to uh, document that they have mastered some technical skills, uh, either um, on an honor system basis or uh, more commonly getting vouched for by mentors or trainers in some way. Uh, we have those uh, in the critical care uh, college credentialing process where program mentors are required to provide training in those skills. And then they're also required to um, uh, confirm that their trainees successfully met those goals. The exam usually uh, only deals with cognitive um, uh, issues, and that is uh, the learned and um, uh, developed uh, cognitive skills that are necessary to perform your jobs. And the classic Bloom's taxonomy divides this into six or seven different uh, uh, levels. And they're usually presented as a kind of a pyramid suggesting that things at the bottom of the pyramid are a foundational information uh, skills uh, that may be less important in practice than the higher level skills. And in reality, they're all kind of equally important. Um, in the critical care college, and I know a number of other professional organizations, we usually don't try to break them down this into this kind of granularity. Uh, for us in ACVAC, um, we break them down into three levels. Um, and the, the one level is recall, uh, which inc includes knowledge and comprehension of facts that have been uh, learned and, and memorized. Uh, application, that is the ability to take that knowledge and apply it to problem sets. Um, a common example would be medical math calculations, for example, uh, as an application level question. Then we just use the word analysis to mean any of analysis, synthesis, or evaluation. Um, and we do in include questions at all three of these levels, um, but we just group them all under one uh, um, title of analysis. So a lot, number of organizations try to break the cognitive challenge of, or level of the question into at least those three. Uh, some, some organizations use more and some go full on with all six of these. Um, for most veterinary medical uh, uh, specialty colleges, um, and I suspect for most VTS organizations, it's probably not necessary to go beyond uh, categorizing questions as recall application or analysis level. It's really kind of up to the exam committee um, to decide what mix is important. And that's based in part on task analysis or at least your own personal impressions of the relative value of different um, uh, of these different levels. Um, anyone who's tried to write questions, especially multiple choice questions, knows that it's a lot harder to write good application and analysis level questions than it is to ask candidates to recall uh, simple bits of information or demonstrate their comprehension of that information. Um, so as you move up the pyramid, so to speak, it gets way more difficult to write good questions and, and it requires a lot more time and effort and review um, ExamSoft uh, gives a number of options. I'll spend part of my time talking about some just pointers on what to do and don't do uh, when you're writing questions. And I'll also give some examples of um, things that may help you use ExamSoft uh, to your best advantage, uh, since uh, um, you know, we're, we're trying to get everybody on board with using ExamSoft and Exemplify as the testing platform for candidates. And ExamSoft gives several options for a question type, uh, multiple choice, true, false, extended matching sets, 
uh, fill in the blank, um, short answer or essay, and hotspot and drag and drop type questions. And I'll briefly talk about all of these, but I'll, I'll focus mostly on um, multiple choice and short answer and essay. Um, we talk about uh, things to do and don't do. Most of you guys uh, use multiple choice questions. So this is just a list of the academies and the information I have um, uh, from uh, um, Linda and Vicki and uh, Lori um, on the types of exams uh, that you guys are using. And, and a number of you uh, solely rely on multiple choice questions. Uh, some incorporate essay and fill in the blank or true, false or other uh, types as well. Multiple choice questions um, are, are really common across all uh, professional organizations that test candidates for uh, credentialing purposes. And um, they have a number of advantages. Um, a, a big one uh, is that the responses are dichotomous. You either get it right or wrong uh, with a, a, a limited choice, multiple choice question. So they're easy to score. Um, they're also easy to configure to different um, cognitive levels. So going back to the recall application and analysis, you can have the same kind of topic and ask a number of questions that require candidates to demonstrate all three of those um, uh, uh, cognitive levels uh, within that same topic range. And they can be validated um, uh, with pretty high precision. So if you use the Angoff process for cut score determination, um, you can get some pretty reliable and repeatable results across um, Angoff judges um, uh, in terms of the uh, cut score determination for exams that are based mostly on multiple choice. So they're, they're pretty popular and they're a, a pretty logical type of question to use for at least a, a part of, the, of any exam. I talked last time briefly about the challenge of having one exam that's comprised by different question types. Uh, so for example, if you have multiple choice essay and practical questions um, in an exam, because multiple choice are routinely one points per question um, and essays are often multiple point questions and uh, practicals or, or, or other type of uh, uh, short answer, or long answer exams often have different point assessments uh, assigned to them. And they also are, are usually designed or the goal anyway is to get different kind of uh, evaluation of candidates than you can get from a multiple choice. So it's really hard to combine those into one exam. And, and as a general rule, a blanket recommendation I would make is to, um, if, if you think it's important to get assessments of candidates through essay questions or um, uh, questions that are any other question design that's not multiple choice, strongly consider having two exams and decide the relative value of those two exams. Uh, for example, in the critical care college, we have a general multiple choice exam, which assesses uh, knowledge and skill at uh, basic physiology and pharmacology, a species specific exam, which is a much more clinically oriented exam that includes questions uh, through the spectrum of recall application and analysis, one for small animal candidates, one for large animal candidates, and then a clinical exam that is uh, heavy on a short answer and essay and fill in the blank. Um, and the candidates are required to pass each of those three independent exams uh, to pass the entire assessment. Um, and it, it's a lot easier to um, uh, set a cut score uh, uh, with um, uh, the Angoff and other processes in each of the exams when they're separated and, and, and uh, we don't have a lot of complexity about how to compare uh, the scores assigned to essay questions against the scores assigned to multiple choice questions. So that's just an aside, but uh, we generally want to try to separate those exams where possible. Bernie, you yeah. noted um, on that chart, there's quite a variety in number of multiple, uh, most of them are multiple choice, but number yeah. Yeah. on their um, credentialing exam, in your professional opinion, is is there any sort of ideal number to have on a, on a credentialing yeah. exam? 
Yeah, there's a lot of argument about that. You know, if you have a, um, if the domains of knowledge that are important for a, a member of the organization are really broad and varied, and you really want to sample as much as that as possible, then you're going to need to ask more questions than, than fewer. Um, most uh, assessment professionals suggest that you should be able to get a pretty good representation of most organizations' uh, skill requirements with 100 questions. Um, most professional organizations have more than 100 questions uh, because they feel that they can't uh, accurately assess that. So there, there, there's some uh, difference there between recommendations by testing professionals and reality on the ground for exam committees that feel like they don't want to underrepresent different areas. I can tell you uh, for our exam in uh, the Critical Care College, we have those two multiple choice exams everybody takes and they're each 150 questions. And then the, the uh, clinical exam is a mix, like I said, of mostly essay short answer. Um, and, and there's uh, um, a, a, from year to year that varies a lot, but there are at least that many questions on that exam. Um, you have to balance uh, broad coverage against uh, fatigue on the part of the candidates. Like, uh, what kind of resources does it take the candidate to take the exam? How much time do they have to invest? Um, if you're not administering the exam remotely, how long do they have to stay at a testing venue? Um, or, you know, that is travel to and stay at a hotel, for example. If you're doing it remotely, like how long can they sit? Uh, for one exam without fatigue. Um, and get one of that. our members is asking, do you have a baseline for how long each they should have to answer a multiple choice question? So, you know, how long to let them answer their 100 questions or 200 questions? Yeah, that varies a lot. And, and to, honestly, to some extent, it's trial and error. But once you've administered an exam and exam soft, you can see what the average response time was on each individual question. And that can start to give you some guidance, like how much uh, time you need. And certainly if you have candidates that don't finish, or if every candidate used every minute allow allotted, that's, that should tell you that you're pushing the limits on, on uh, what they can accomplish in the time given. Um, so, so we kind of pay attention to that and look at uh, how many people uh, finish early, how many people use the full amount of time, and um, whether there's unanswered questions uh, left at the end for, for some candidates. So um, no hard and fast rules, but if you're trying to get a mix of recall application and analysis, remember that application and analysis questions can take way longer than a recall question. For recall question, uh, that either tests basic uh, recall of a factoid or comprehension of that factoid in a, in a scenario, um, that's a lot easier than to do a complex fluid plan, for example, um, uh, or uh, analyze um, uh, the, the ideal diagnostic or therapeutic path to take for a, a patient based on a long clinical scenario. Um, so you have to take that into account when you're creating the exam. So first time you do it, it's going to be a bit of a guess. Um, but uh, and, and if it looks like candidates really struggled for time, you're going to have to figure out a way to account for that and adjust the scoring uh, after the exam is done. Once you've got a little bit of experience with it, then you can get a better sense for um, how much you can pack into the, the time allotted. So going back to the example of the ACVAC exam, the college exam, they have two eight hour days of exams. So they have four hours morning, four hour afternoon on two days in a row. So that's pushing the limits, I think, of what a human can tolerate uh, for, for an exam. And I think uh, nobody uh, on this call has that you know, challenging uh, a, a couple of days for their candidates. Um, but uh, you know, if we're any uh, example, we give our candidates four hours for 150 questions. And there's some candidates that take the full four hours uh, for that. 
it might be uh, like for uh, um, anyone here who's had a, a few years of experience with uh, ExamSoft, um, if you can share your experiences with your colleagues, because uh, 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 your exams are all kind of similar that way. There's a bunch of 100 to 200 point multiple uh, or question multiple choice exams and uh, sharing that information across the VTS specialties might be pretty helpful that way. A um, little, a few comments on other types of questions. Uh, True/false questions are are uh, useful. Uh, we don't use them at all in the um, in our exam, um, but but they can be used. And uh, commonly, it's easy to make them one point questions. For example, like multiple choice questions, and these are basically asking the exam taker to judge the validity of a statement. And unfortunately, we usually write them to test simple recall. Um, I just took an example out of a, um, a physics exam here um, and a simplified, less than ideal, true, false question uh, for that uh, uh, domain of knowledge would be this one, a body immersed in a fluid is buoyed up by a force equal to the weight of the fluid displaced. Um, and it's usually better to write these um, to probe uh, the candidate's knowledge of more complex associations. So another way you could rewrite this one uh, for a physics exam would be uh, down here. If an object of volume V cubic centimeters is surrounded by a liquid, the upward force on it is equal to the weight of V cubic centimeters of the liquid. So it's basically asking the same thing as this but it forces the, the candidate to think through it a little bit more. Uh, so where they might've uh, seen uh, this first one as a little factoid and, uh, uh, that's easy to remember, this one kind of forces you to think through uh, the physics behind the question. Uh, so if you write true false questions, it's useful to think of the principles behind uh, uh, the point you're trying to make or, or test. And, and force the candidate to uh, think about some complex associations that uh, lie that underlie that um, concept. Um, ExamSoft offers extended matching sets, um, uh, and, and these are um, written as either a multiple choice question with many choices, or a fill in the uh, fill in the blank question using a drop down list that has multiple options. And um, these questions use a long list of short choices. So the key here is these are one or two or three word choices at the most uh, to answer a lead in after a clinical scenario is presented. Um, and the advantage of this is you can make a, a one long list like six, 10, 12, 15, 20 options. And they're, again, they're all short one word or two word or three word choices and use that same list in several questions. So you can create a clinical scenario and then have that be the basis of several questions in a row um, that um, uh, are probing similar uh, uh, domains of knowledge, um, but ask the candidate to choose these short uh, responses from a long list. And so in, in some settings that can be a value. Um, it usually it requires um, a, a, a clinical presentation um, and you're probing um, kind of deeply into the understanding of different options for that. We don't use these in the, in the critical care college exam, but, but that's a, a valid approach. And for, for some of your clinical uh, uh, fill in the blank kind of questions. This could be a useful option that's worth taking a look at. These are um, usually similar to analysis level multiple choice questions, like the candidate has to think through a bunch of information presented as a clinical vignette, a, a case scenario, um, uh, to arrive at uh, um, a deduction that allows them to choose the correct response from a long list of possible responses. Fill in the blank questions are another option in ExamSoft, and you can use those for those extended uh, 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 choice questions or as a simple short answer question. I just uh, screen grab this off the um, uh, enterprise uh, versions uh, fill in the blank question. 
it gives you the option to do free text drop down or a numerical response that's within a prescribed range. And if you use a fill in the blank question, um, don't you don't write a question that has any more than three blanks to fill. Um, like you want this question to be graded in a, cons you want the questions to be graded consistently. And typically, if you're throwing these into a multiple choice exam, if this isn't a standalone fill in the blank and essay exam, you want this to be worth the same amount of points as a multiple choice question. And so in other words, if you have a multiple choice uh, section with one point per question, and you have some fill in the blank questions in the same exam, you want those fill in the blank questions to be worth one point. So if you have three blanks or fill in the blanks in this question, they should get all three of those to get one point. And you could decide whether to give partial credit or if they need to get all three um, blanks to get a full uh, point or not. And either way could be valid. Um, but you want the question to be worth the same amount as um, the multiple choice questions. So don't use more than one to three um, blanks for any single question. If you start dividing it into four or more and the whole question is only worth one point, um, the candidates are going to question whether they should spend time on it if they're running short on time. Um, and, and you're getting down to some um, pretty um, uh, uh, fine points. Uh, if the question's worth one point and, and you're going to require them to get all four blanks to get that full point, uh, that's getting pretty uh, nit, uh, nitpicky. Um, you should only allow free text questions when there is a widely accepted one or maybe two or three word phrase that's the correct answer and that you demand proper spelling. So if it's free text, the candidate's got to get the spelling exact. Um, and if it's a three word answer, that gets harder. Um, if there's synonyms that are also acceptable, um, then you're gonna have to either anticipate that or go back after the exam and uh, accept an answer that ExamSoft rejected. So, so you should use free text responses really infrequently um, and only when uh, there's one ex widely accepted answer. And note that you have to um, get it exactly as uh, uh, you specify in the answer uh, when you build this question. So if the word shouldn't be capitalized and the candidate capitalizes it, ExamSoft is gonna count that as wrong. If they put a period after it, it's gonna get countered as wrong. So you need to give the candidate some guidance like no caps, no, no uh, periods or no punctuation and, and put that in the body of the question to uh, remind them that they're only supposed to uh, specifically write what you want. And then you could argue that if the question uh, tells the candidate do not capitalize and they capitalize anyway, you could argue that it's okay to, to count that as wrong because uh, they didn't follow instructions. Um, but it gets really hairy uh, if there's a lot of room for synonyms in a free text response. So I think you should use those very sparingly. Um, and uh, only when there's a widely accepted uh, single way to spell something. And you have to anticipate as many variations on that as possible. For example, if the answer is potassium, you have to accept K and K plus as possible uh, acceptable synonyms. Um, and think about things like that in advance. So um, the, the advantage of these is that the machine will grade it for you. So you, uh, if, if uh, there's very few possible synonyms and you predicted them all um, and you uh, instructed the candidates, you're not gonna accept capitalized uh, responses or, or punctuation, uh, then ExamSoft will grade it very quickly for you and it can be kind of easy. Um, you could also do drop downs where you give them a fixed list of options. Um, if you do that, it's and you only have two or, th or three or four drop downs, you've now turned this into a multiple choice question. So why not just write a multiple choice question? Well, you could put two or three blanks in the one question 
And so you are making it more complex than a sim simple drop or a simple multiple choice question. Um, and that would be a reason to have more than one blank to fill uh, in a fill in the blank question. Um, but if you only have one, you've essentially written a, a multiple choice question and why not just make it a multiple choice? So it's the same format as most of the questions on your exam. Um, if you have more than four choices, now you're making a kind of an extended, uh, um, uh, uh, extended uh, uh, option list. Um, and, and that would be appropriate if you uh, put this after a clinical scenario uh, that they have to think through stuff. And there's a lot of plausible options uh, for this that they have to think their way through. Um, so that's a cognitively challenging question that's going to take them a fair amount of time. Um, uh, but, but a drop down with a lot of choices could be appropriate in that setting. Um, ExamSoft also offers uh, drag and drop questions, and this is a screen grab out of the Enterprise Edition. Um, there's not really any advantage over this uh, of this over multiple choice or ex uh, extended uh, uh, list uh, questions uh, with multiple answers, but it might be useful um, in an exam that is mainly multiple choice. And you want to ask some questions where more than one choice is correct. So there's two ways to do that. One is that you could write all your questions as multiple choice. And in this particular question, add the phrase, choose any of the, any of the options that apply. And so you might have a list of uh, more than four choices. And for example, you might have 10 choices and six of them are, are acceptable responses. You have to decide like how you're going to score that. Are you going to give full or partial credit for it um, if they miss some of those choices? Um, but a candidate who's under a lot of pressure, especially if they're pressed for time and they're used to a single correct answer, multiple choice question for the previous uh, 85 questions. And now they have one in front of them that they're supposed to choose all that apply that might throw them off a bit. On the other hand, if you present it, it is a completely different format where they have to use their mouse to click on any appropriate responses and drag them over to a box of correct answers. That puts them in a different mindset. And so like that drives home to them that this is not a, a, a regular one option or one answer multiple choice question. So I think that's a potential advantage of drag and drop is that it, it just looks very distinct in the Exemplify uh, platform and clues the candidate in that, oh, there's more than one option here. I have to, I have to indicate all the possible uh, correct options. So otherwise, there, it's basically a multiple choice question, um, uh, but it's most useful when there's more than one correct choice and it's presented in a different look that clues the candidate in uh, to the fact that they need to uh, look for more than one correct answer. A uh, short answer, um, which can include long answers, um, are questions that require the candidate to type in free text to answer the question. And you can specify um, that it's long or short um, uh, by how you set up the question. And in ExamSoft, you can set a character limit where you want to force the candidate to adhere to principles of precision and brevity uh, in their answer. Um, but it does require free text and it requires a team of people to grade them. Um, you as an author have to give guidance to the candidates for the length and format of the response. And that can be done in advance of the exam, like in the instructions and in the individual question, but you should give them some guidance for what you're looking for. If there's any ambigu ambiguity uh, about the response or if the possible responses, including the, uh, word diarrhea, uh, where the candidate writes on and on when you're really looking for a very short response by comparison. Um, it's really important that these questions be graded by teams of at least two graders. Um, and they're using an answer key provided by the question author. And that answer key has to be a living document that, you, that the team can modify on the fly. Um, so the way that we've gone to do this in ACFAC is uh, uh, we've been grading the exam over Zoom, 
and people are divided up into rooms of two two graders per um, a question, and they're in constant communication as they grade the exam on ExamSoft, and they compare um, uh, their their scores on these questions. And when they come across an answer that the author had not anticipated, that looks like it's plausibly correct, then the two members of the team discuss that and decide whether or not they're going to decide, uh, allow that as an acceptable response and add that then to the answer key. So going forward, they always accept that new response. Um, so, so it's really important to be able to uh, change your criteria on the fly because candidates will always think of ways uh, to correctly answer a question or acceptably answer, que answer a question anyway uh, that you had not anticipated. Um, so you have to uh, uh, be prepared for that. And sometimes you'll come across a response that, yeah, it seems okay, but um, I'm not going to accept it. But then you find another one and then another one uh, that gives the same response. And it, it might turn out that you have 20% of your candidates giving that same uh, response. And, and you may decide by the time you've come across that many that eh, there's a reason for why so many people are answering it this way and figure that out. And um, then you have to be prepared to go back and get partial or complete credit uh, to the people that got it, uh, that you marked wrong earlier. So it's really kind of a dynamic um, process and, and a, you need a team of people that agree uh, on the final results. You don't want one person responsible uh, for, for um, all those decisions. Here's um, an example uh, from uh, an ACVAC exam. Uh, one of our, our clinical exam is based on scenarios um, and our mostly short answer slash essay. And I, I just screen grabbed um, a, a few from an exam from a few years ago. And the clinical exam uh, is broken up into scenarios and each scenario has a variable number of questions. So the first question of the scenario tells the candidate how many questions and how many points are in the scenario and that they all refer to this, uh, uh, this two-year-old male castrated Weimaraner dog. It gives some initial information, tells the candidate that baseline clinical pathology data is attached and there's an attachment they can open up uh, and exemplify. And then the first question is on the same page and it tells them to use the numbered list button to create a complete list of all abnormalities identified on the physical exam and in the attached clinical pathology data. So it gives them uh, what to expect. It gives them the baseline information and then the first question. And then the next question um, gives them the number of points assigned to it. And it has them list five in this example, toxic products or plants along with their toxic principles. And it tells them exactly how to uh, write their response. So I attach, or we attach the same clinical pathology data uh, from the last question so they can re refer back to that same table uh, and don't have to go back uh, to the previous question to see the information. And I tell them to use the numbered list button to number your responses one to five and organize them as follows. So they click on the number list and it pops up with number one and they, they are to write the first toxin, a colon, and the second, uh, and then the toxic principle or compound in that product. Um, before the exam, they're, they're given instructions on how to do this as well. And this makes it efficient for the candidate um, to get through uh, the exam quickly. And it makes it efficient for the graders uh, so that everybody uh, or most candidates format their question the same way. Because these are fairly complex uh, and the candidate has to pace themselves, if your exam is going to have a number of like essay questions or fill in the blank questions, um, it's useful to give them a, a roadmap on what to expect. So a couple of weeks before our exam, uh, I email the candidates a roadmap for the clinical exam that, uh, that spells out exactly how many questions are in each session. So these are four, um, uh, uh, four uh, 
sessions and how many scenarios there are and how many points are on each question and what question type they are to expect. And there's a little summary on how many questions there are in which scenario, the percentage of points assigned to those questions. And if you spend an equal amount of time on them, how many minutes you should spend on each scenario. So I, I tell the candidates to print this out and take it with them to the exam uh, so that they can pace themselves as they go through the exam. So none of your exams are this uh, crazy busy uh, with uh, essay questions. Uh, ours is crazy busy. And so they really need a roadmap. But if your exam even has um, a fraction of this, if, if there's a time consuming set of essay questions, it's gonna be helpful to your candidates to kind of know how to pace themselves. And so if you can give them a bit of a roadmap on what to expect um, uh, on a lengthy set of essay questions, I think that's useful. Hotspot questions can be useful um, when candidates need to identify something off of visual, like a radiograph, for example, dental radiographs. Um, this is just a, a question I grabbed off a, um, a class that I teach here at NC State. Um, uh, where we teach students uh, a few basic principles of, um, uh, uh, in this example, placing a nasal oxygen catheter. And the, and the students are taught to uh, measure the catheter uh, for a, a standard uh, low flow nasal oxygen catheter to position the tip of the catheter or position the catheter in the ventral nasal meatus and position the tip of the catheter um, at the level of the vertical ramus of the mandible. Uh, so this question asks them to click on this um, uh, CAT scan image, the anatomical landmark, uh, that's the optimal position for the tip of a nasal oxygen catheter. So they take their mouse and they click over the vertical ramus of the mandible. And if they click anywhere outside that rectangle, um, they don't get any points for the question. Um, so there's, there's some types of questions where that kind of graphical presentation uh, is useful and can test their ability to recognize things on graphics uh, that might be hard to do on a multiple choice exam, for example. Um, some considerations for the candidates. Uh, this is a high stakes exam. Um, like a lot of our candidates have spent 12 years getting to this point um, and, and uh, they have a job who's uh, um, pay structure and employment security is going to depend on them passing the exam. So these guys are stressed to the max and they're going to be brain dead uh, for, uh, compared to what they would, would have been a, a week later. Um, back in the day when, when we uh, used Scantron sheets for the candidates to um, uh, uh, write their answers uh, down on, even though I spent many minutes having them write their names fill out their names with the Scantron, um, fill, you know, fill in the letters. Every year, there'd be one or two candidates that would not write their ID number or, or their name on the, on the Scantron. And so we'd have to figure out after the exam who those people were. So really stupid stuff happens. So the simpler you can make it, the better. So your candidates have put a lot of hard work into getting credentialed to take the exam and they've really studied hard to take the exam and they're super stressed and stuff that none of them would miss on a normal day, some people are gonna miss. So you really have to make the exam as fair as possible by spelling everything out uh, 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 in advance and on the day of the exam. Um, part of that process should be to provide them a mock exam uh, on Exemplify well in advance of the exam that walks them through all the important points of navigating through Examplify. Now, Examsoft uh, publishes some really useful um, uh, uh, online things. And I can't remember for sure, they, they for sure have instructions on how to launch and use Examplify. I'm not sure how um, great um, uh, any examples they have are uh, in terms of how to navigate through Examplify particularly for your exam. Um, so I think it's well worth your time as an exam committee member to create a mock exam. And I'll just show you 
what ours looks like. Let's see. Whoops. I guess I have to bug out of this to. Yeah. So, so I create mock exams for multiple choice and for clinicals. Um, and I give these to our candidates well in advance. And this is just the first question on the mock clinical exam. And I basically took uh, an old uh, clinical exam question and added notes to it that I highlight in yellow. Um, so I tell them this is what the exam is going to, uh, the format and structure of the exam and what you're going to see and give them really important points on, on what to do as they, as they work through the exam. Oop, I got to log in again here. See if I can find my mock exam again. Well, here's a, I'll do a couple of others here too. Um, one of the exams I have, if, if you're going to use um, the remote uh, monitoring or remote proctoring uh, feature in ExamSoft, make sure you have a very short proctored mock exam that locks down their computer and, and puts it through its paces to make sure it just technically works uh, for the exam. So if you're doing remote exam proctoring uh, through um, that service ExamSoft provides, make sure you run them through a, a trial of the, of the uh, proctored uh, exam. So it locks down their computer and, and, uh, and uh, make sure they can still play videos um, and do everything they need to do for your exam if it's gonna contain uh, 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 multi-format graphical stuff like that. For, for the general, oh, I, I give them a like 150 question multiple choice exam just so they can uh, go through. I tell them in advance these questions are all called crappy questions, um, and so there's a lot of bad questions in this, which I warn them about. But it gives them experience at navigating through the exam. And for the clinical exam, because it's really helpful for them and for us to give them practice at how we want them to answer essay and, and uh, short answer questions, we, I give them a lot of pointers on how to uh, respond to different types of questions that we include on our exam. So once you, uh, once you have your exam kind of roughed in, um, like create a mock exam that gives them the same experience. Obviously you're not gonna give them exam questions, but either take old questions or uh, make up some uh, uh, nonsense questions um, that puts them through the same steps they need to do to navigate an exam soft. Um, so this one, I point out that this question has a character limit. So I set the character limit to 200 on this, and that forces them to be precise and short uh, in, in their responses. Fill in the blank questions. If it's a free text question, tell them that they really need to pay attention to their spelling, et cetera. So long story short, you want the mock exam to give them a strong flavor of what to expect on your examination and have them go through the steps they need to do to successfully navigate in ExamSoft. So your instructions should be clear and concise, and that includes your pre-exam day instructions to the candidates and instructions on the day of the exam before they start. If you haven't already, take real advantage of um, uh, the, the templates in ExamSoft to give them last minute instructions as they uh, launch the exam. Uh, all your questions should be presented with consistent formatting. 
So there should be one or maybe two people responsible for the final kind of editing pass on your exam. And make sure the questions all look alike, um, that they use the same kind of formatting and grammar and structure um, to reduce the cognitive load on the candidates so they don't have to like get used to a whole different style of question presentation in, in one multiple choice exam. Uh, among the things you can do with the template at the, at the start of the exam uh, are confidentiality agreements. So we don't have our candidates sign anything um, uh, for confidentiality, but they're forced to read and accept this confidentiality agreement. And if they click on this and they proceed past this template, that means that legally they've uh, read, understood, and agreed to the restrictions imposed by this confidentiality agreement. I also have another template with last minute, like very short bullet point instructions for them um, and some reassuring words to relax. You know, the crashes, the clock stops, you're not going to lose any time, uh, take a deep breath, et cetera. So you can put some really helpful information at the start of the exam on that. Um, on your questions themselves, um, be really consistent on how the uh, questions appear. So uh, for us, I tell uh, authors and, and I edit the question so that um, if there's tables of data or tables of information that are small, um, they should go in the body of the question in the, in the question stem. And the language uh, that we use is the following laboratory data was obtained, for example. If you have large tables or any graphics, those should go on as attachments. So unless you're doing a hotspot question where the candidate needs to point to something on a graphic, um, graphics should be attached, not uh, embedded in the question, because if they're attached, then the candidate can manipulate them. They can magnify or shrink, move them around on the screen, uh, rotate them, et cetera. Um, so uh, graphics and large tables should uh, be attached uh, wherever possible. So, and we refer to those as attached instead of uh, following or, or uh, whatever. And then on multiple choice questions, if you're referring to the choices, rather than say following, um, I recommend to say listed below because they really are in kind of a separate window area uh, as they're presented in Exemplify. And that allows you to reserve the word following for stuff you might embed in the question uh, that the candidates need to go through. Uh, so for us in the critical care college, a lot of these questions have laboratory data or, or other types of table data um, and referring to that as following data uh, separates that out from questions listed below. Uh, so it's a minor point, but pay real attention to the formatting things like this. And, and that's really hard unless you do it a lot. And that's why it's good to have one person kind of responsible for editing and, uh, and that person learns to get an eagle eye for uh, uh, formatting problems like that. All right, more specifically on the multiple choice questions, um, the components of those questions are the stem, which is the body of the entire question. If there's more than one sentence um, in the stem, then the last sentence is the lead in to the choices. Um, a lot of multiple choice questions might only have one uh, sentence and, th and that is the lead in. Um, but particularly if you've got a application or analysis level question, you may need to present a fair amount of information, you may have attachments, etc. Uh, that are um, presented as part of the stem. The question has an answer also called a key response in a testing world. Um, uh, I suspect most of you have your multiple choice questions set up so that most of them have only one acceptable response. Um, you can have multiple acceptable responses. Um, if you do that, it's probably useful to, to make that an extended multiple response uh, type of question and have a longer list. Um, and those responses need to be very short, one or two word uh, responses. But if it's a, 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 a typical multiple choice question, um, they can have an answer and probably no more than three distractors. Uh, and they can be longer, more complicated choices um, than a, a extended multiple list type of question. 
And if you're writing a standard uh, multiple choice question where the, the choices have potentially quite a few words in them, um, you shouldn't have certainly no more than four. And some folks argue that um, two distractors and one answer is ideal. Um, in the critical care college, we have three distractors and one uh, answer. And uh, in the past, sometimes we had five choices and nobody wrote good choices for five. Uh, that's really hard uh, as an author to come up with four plausible incorrect distractors and one answer. So it's hard enough to write three distractors that are plausible. Um, so I highly recommend no more than three dis uh, distractors. And if you have more then they're short one or two or maybe three word choices uh, for extended matching sets. For the stem and the lead in use proper grammar, spelling and formatting. Uh, so this is like, if any of you guys have written an article, you know that your rough draft is full of horrific mistakes. And if you put it aside and come back to it a week later, you're appalled that you missed all the things you, that you missed. Um, it's the same thing here. Like even though you're not writing a manuscript, you're writing a, a very short question. It's super easy to put spelling mistakes, grammar errors, really basic dumb stuff. Uh, and I do that all the time. Um, that you'll catch on a second pass. So, so, so really work on that, edit your question, put it away, put it aside for hours or days, come back to it, re-edit, and, and certainly have another person look at it as well. Um, include only information needed to choose the answer or a distractor. Uh, any, any of you folks who have tried to write a question based on a scenario or a clinical vignette, usually start out like I do with a image in my head of a case presented to me or a set of lab data presented to me and you have this solid thing in your mind and, and you start writing it out and you you try to make it uh you try to put to words the image in your head to give the clearest picture of what you have in front of you as possible Basically what you wind up doing there is confusing the candidate with a lot of information. They're actually not gonna need for the answer. Um, and so for, clinic, for questions based on clinical vignettes, it's really common to put information in there that you totally don't need. And so you have to winnow it down to only the information needed to choose the answer or a plausible distractor to a, for an unknowledgeable candidate. So for things based on clinical vignettes, you really need to pay attention to the, uh, the, the structure of that question and revise, revise, revise to get rid of unnecessary words and sentences. Um, there's basically two kinds of lead-ins. Uh, one would be a direct question, uh, which of the procedures listed below is the most appropriate next step for this patient? In that case, the, the, the choices are typically not sentences, so they're not capitalized and they don't have a period after them. Um, or you could ask the candidate to complete the following sentence. Uh, and so the lead in might look like this, the most appropriate next step for this patient is to, and then you have an ellipsis there, three dots. Um, and then the choices are not capitalized because they complete a sentence. And they should all end with a period just to make them follow uh, in a grammatically correct way. Uh, so to correctly punctuate that question, uh, there's a period at the end. When you're writing these, uh, use precise, clear language that tests a single point or concept. Um, like you're really looking for a focused response and make sure all the choices follow the lead in grammatically. Um, so that automatically rules out choices that are all of the above or none of the above, which you should never use anyway. Um, but especially in exam soft, because you should be randomizing the choices, you can't use those words. So, so get rid of any choices that are all of the above or none of the above, because those are A, they're not good, and B, they won't work in exam soft when you randomize the choices. Ask about important medical points, not trivia. Uh, a real common mistake for novice question writers in the critical care college is to ask a question about a specific manuscript, which is fair enough. The candidates are told that there's some specific manuscripts they need to know. But the, the question should be about the main theme of that manuscript. It should be in the abstract of the manuscript and not some trivia taken out of the uh, 
uh, details of the materials and methods for the manuscript. So you want to know the main, like if you're working with this person, or if this person needs to apply that manuscript to patient care, it needs to be the most important point about that manuscript, not some trivia point. Um, put enough information in the stem that they can choose an answer or a plausible distractor, but, but not so much that um, it's wasting their time. And write your question so that a knowledgeable candidate can answer it without looking at the choices. So if you only remember one thing about uh, uh, how, to, how to set up your, your question is that a knowledgeable candidate could put a piece of paper over the part of the screen that's got all the choices and answer the question. Um, so, so that's a great way to think about how to structure the lead in uh, to the question. The candidate should be able to answer it without looking at your options. Um, things to don't do, don't do this in a rush, like give yourself enough time um, to uh, look at your exam blueprint, choose testing points that uh, add to that blueprint and are aligned with it. Um, choose your testing point for that specific question, decide how you're going to structure it, um, write it out, and then revise it, revise it, revise it, put it away, come back and edit it. Um, and do the same with the choices. So, so take your time with these. These are very time consuming. It takes me hours to write a application or analysis level multiple choice question. Um, uh, they're really hard to write uh, well, um, and I'm, I'm not perfect at it by any means. I, I have colleagues that find mistakes in mine all the time. Don't ask for trivial information. As I said, uh, the question should be about the main point of a report. Don't include unnecessary information. Don't write stories. Um, uh, like I've called a lot of questions that have a full paragraph of a clinical vignette. And then the lead in didn't require any of that information at all. Um, so, uh, so, so be really particular about weeding out unnecessary story information. And like I said earlier, don't use all of the above or none of the above. And don't write questions in the negative, um, like um, all of the following are acceptable except. Uh, that's a question you should not be writing. Don't write multiple true false questions, like which of the following is true, which of the following is false, um, particularly authors like to write which of the following is false or incorrect because those are easy. Uh, so that doesn't require much for the question author because you can look at a book chapter or a manuscript and pick out four random things from that um, manuscript or book chapter that are correct and then make up something that's incorrect. And that's a really bad way to test a candidate. One of the, the, the defects in that approach is that you typically are going to wind up with four choices that are unrelated to each other and they're, they're not all related to your testing point. Like you want the candidate to know a particular concept. And um, if you have four unrelated statements there, you're not asking them about that concept. You're asking them, are each of these, are, you're asking four independent true false questions. Um, and so it defeats your purpose. If your goal is to um, test their knowledge, comp comprehension, application or analysis of this testing point that's important for your organization, um, you're not gonna be able to do that with this type of question. Um, don't use uh, perspective grammar, and that is uh, I, you, they. Um, that wastes words, it wastes time, uh, and, and uh, it, it's just unnecessary. So don't use questions like your service clinician orders this, or you are asked to, or she asks you to, or you're presented with. Don't put it in a, a, a perspective grammar like that. Instead of saying you are presented with a dog that, just say a dog presents that or, or whatever. You don't want to personalize the grammar on this. And don't use ambiguous terms, especially don't require candidates to choose ambiguous terms in the choices like common, rare, frequently, infrequently. 
Um, and Don Ray got your questions. Like, like you're not trying to trip a candidate up with a, a, a question that gets them because they missed a key little nuanced word. Like make this you know, plausible for somebody under a lot of time pressure on a high stakes exam uh, who, who knows the information, but it's going to be tripped up because they read through it too quickly. Um, so, so, you know, be kind to these people. Um, I'm going to finish up, uh, I guess the only point I'll make on this slide, uh, this is the last slide I'm going to use, and I'm going to uh, jump over to ExamSoft. Um, we write some questions that are about a particular manuscript. Candidates are warned in advance what is free game or, or fair game uh, for the exam in terms of manuscripts. So for example, small an animal candidates are given a list of manuscripts that they're, they're supposed to read. Uh, so that's a defined list. They're given months in advance and we want them to read those manuscripts uh, uh, for the exam. And they'll be tested on a few of those manuscripts. We also tell them uh, that they're responsible for literature, in the case of the small animal candidates, for the past three years from these journals. So they have a list of journals and they're responsible. And their mentors give them a lot of guidance on what's important for the college and what's likely to be on the exam. So even though they have several journals they're responsible for, the number of manuscripts that are probably fair game are pretty small uh, compared to the number of manuscripts in those journals. And if we're writing a question that is specific to a journal article, we tell them that. And so this is how we word those questions. So according to the first author, 2018, and the citation is at the bottom, it's highlighted uh, yellow, it's in bold. Um, so it draws the candidates a question, uh, attention to the fact that this question is coming specifically from this manuscript. And that gets important because um, the answer to this might depend on the author. Uh, so there may be books that contradict this uh, manuscript, for example. Um, so it's really important that if it's specific to a manuscript, the candidates know that. If it's not specific to a manuscript, we require our authors to find at least two references not written by the same author to support the testing point answer uh, that they write in that question. So they're required to use at least two textbooks or a textbook and a manuscript or two manuscripts. And they all have to be written by different authors. And that's because uh, if it's written by at least two different people and it's published, that increases the likelihood that it's a commonly accepted answer uh, to this question, that, that uh, more than one person thinks this is a correct answer. Um, so, so I think that's an important thing for any of you guys writing questions is that you have at least two citations to support your answer and to support why your distractors are wrong, um, just to increase the likelihood that this is widely held knowledge within your specialty. Okay, I'm gonna bug out of ExamSoft or uh, um, PowerPoint and finish up or over time here, but I'm gonna show just a couple of things in exam saw. So a uh, last thing I'll do here is I just pulled up uh, some cold questions um, and uh, that have problems. And I just wanna show some potential ways to address these. So uh, this question authoring interface looks different for me than it does for you because I use the uh, legacy version of ExamSoft instead of the enterprise version. So the, the interface is different, but they basically do the same thing. Um, this question, um, uh, I'll just read it quick. Uh, lactator ringers has the following composition and it lists a bunch of stuff here. The molecular weight of dextrose is 180. Assuming you first remove an equal volume of LRS from a one liter bag, what is the osmolality of the final solution following the addition of a sufficient volume of 50% dextrose to create a 2.5% dextrose in LRS solution? That is a very busy question. It's got a lot of numbers in, in the, the body of it. Um, and the choices here um, have, um, uh, let me make sure that's the, oops. yeah. Yeah, I'm just recognizing that this is not the question I wanted to 
ask because I don't have an improved version of that. Let me. Yeah, I think this is the one I want. Um, this is the color question I, I meant to bring up. So this one's a little shorter. In the past literature, loop diuretics such as furosemide are recommended in the treatment of acute ki kidney injury, comma, what is their mechanism of action and recently published recommendations? Well, first of all, grammatically, this question's a mess. Like it's not even a correctly written uh, question grammatically. Um, and it has some unnecessary words in it, like in past literature, um, and, uh, and recently published recommendations. Um, those are completely unnecessary. And down here in the choices, it repeats an, a, a few words in each choice, loop diuretics block the, um, and, and that's forcing the candidate, A, to try to figure out what you're asking up here, and B, to read unnecessary words that are repeated in each choice. Um, so you shouldn't need the same words repeated in each choice. Uh, that takes candidates time and then just adds to the cognitive load they need to get through this question. So rather than do that, a potential, um, oh gosh darn it, my exam soft is malfunctioning. Let me go back to assessments here. Okay. So instead of written like that, this is a, a, a way you might improve that. So I got rid of the unnecessary bits in the question and cleaned it up grammatically. And the author was trying to get at where in the nephron do loop diuretics work. Um, he kind of gave them uh, uh, that they inhibit ion transport. So I got rid of those in the, that in the choices. And what role do they serve in the treatment of acute kidney injury? Not what is the recent literature? Um, so I turned this into two concepts um, that I've combined in different ways in these choices. And I don't repeat the same phrases in these choices. So the answer to this is they work in the loop of Henley and they're used to manage fluid overload, but do not have direct diuretic or direct therapeutic effects. Um, the second choice is also loop of Henley, but with a different uh, role uh, to play in acute kidney injury, they hasten recovery of epithelial function. This, the last two choices are a different location with the same uh, uh, potential way that they serve in the treatment. So there's uh, two um, uh, options for location and two options for the role they play in treatment. And I can combine those. So there's four unique choices here. So it kind of limits, uh, it gets to the point of what the author is trying to ask and it gets rid of the unnecessary words that the author had on the questions. This one has a bunch of information about a cat that had multiple severe bite wounds had an elective orthopedic procedure performed four days ago and a fentanyl patch is applied. The cat's currently on a fentanyl infusion and still appears very painful. You, you worry about possible opioid induced hyperalgesia. Which of the following drugs could be added to the fentanyl to address this possible complication? So they've got four choices. They're all capitalized, even though they're not proper uh, nouns. And it's got a bunch of information that's completely unnecessary. Um, so a better way to ask this and, and get at the same testing point is this addition of which of the drugs listed below is most likely to improve analgesia in an injured cat that also has suspected opioid induced hyperalgesia. And so it gives the same choices um, and they're no longer capitalized. But that's what the, that's the testing point the author was trying to get at. Um, but you're able to ask that question with much fewer words. So this author was trying to create a clinical uh, image in his mind um, that made sense to him uh, that would be a real life presentation. But the question winds up asking something that you don't need all that information to answer. So they, they force the candidate to kind of guess what the author's trying to get at with all this unnecessary information when really the author just wanted the answer to this short question. 
uh, kind of the same deal on this one. Um, I don't think I'll spend any time on it, but this is a cat with evidence of hypovolemia and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And it's got a bunch of unnecessary information there. Um, oh, and the, the, the fatal flaw of this question is that buried in all this information the candidate has to wade through is the fact that the lead-in says, which of the following would be the least desirable? And for the anxious candidate in a hurry who's running short on time, it's so easy to miss least desirable. Um, like they're gonna look through this and maybe not even read the lead in and, and click off which question is gonna be the best induction agent for this cat. So that's really unfair to the candidate to hide least desirable in the body of all that information. So it's better to get rid of all the unnecessary junk in that question and really make it as plain as possible to the candidate that you're looking for least desirable. So at a minimum, I would capitalize, bold, italicize, underline, uh, least desirable. You might even highlight it yellow um, just to make it uh, uh, flamingly obvious that you're looking for the least desirable agent in this case. Um, this question, uh, buries a bunch of number information in a question um, and has unnecessary information in the body of the question and asks them to, this question asks the candidate to calculate the alveolar arterial uh, uh, oxygen gradient uh, on this animal. It puts millimeters of mercury into every choice down here and it has the choices in non-ascending or non descending order. So these are kind of in random numerical order. So a fix for this includes less information that you don't need to answer the question and putting the data that's hard to read in a sentence into a table so it's easy to assess. Put the numerical responses in ascending or descending order. It doesn't matter which, but I would lock those in in a particular order from smallest to largest. And I moved millimeters of mercury from the choices to up here in the, in the body of the question. Um, uh, and so that gets rid of a little bit of the clutter down here. Um, so this is easier to read for the candidate, organizes the data out of a sentence into a table that makes it a lot easier to follow. Um, and it is gonna be easier for the candidate to get through. So those are just four quick examples. Um, so this is stuff that's hard. Multiple choice questions are really hard to write. Um, essay type questions are really hard to grade. Um, and uh, it's really hard to anticipate candidate responses uh, when, when they're uh, writing free text responses. Uh, so nobody's perfect at this. It's a lot of hard work. Uh, for those of you who are on exam committees, uh, congratulations and thank you for the hard work. Um, and uh, hopefully this has given you a few things to think about. And I'll stop here uh, and uh, be glad to take any questions, uh, uh, Vicki or Lori, if you want to relay those. Um, yeah. Hi, um, so if, if there's any questions, um, put them in the Q&A box. And I do have one question. Um, right before you started showing the exam soft examples, you talked about um, having no negative questions. Mm -hmm. Could you um, explain a little bit more why? Yeah, um, so the main, uh, the main reason is that candidates miss that all the time. Um, mm -hmm. like, like that last thing I showed you where I uh, emphasized least desirable, like that kind of question is okay because uh, for in, in that example, all four of those agents might have been somewhat or three of the agents might have been somewhat okay um, uh, but the fourth one was definitely not okay and so that's a that's fair game uh, as long as you make it really plain that you're looking for the least desirable like i did there but what what typically happens is that because they're easy to write authors want to write questions that all of the following are true except this one and candidates get tripped about tripped up by that except constantly. Uh, so again, these people are anxious, they're under a lot of stress, they're maybe short on time, and those questions are notorious 
for tripping candidates up. So they're just bad. It's a bad format for the anxious time stress candidate. Um, and that's the that's the main reason not to, to, to ask it. But when you're when you're looking to rank order a set of choices from sort of OK to definitely not OK, um, then the least, you know, asking a negative a question in the negative in that setting is is acceptable. But what authors tend to do is they they just pick four true statements out of a book chapter and then make up a, a wrong statement. And call it good, and that's definitely uh, that hurts you. It hurts the exam, and it hurts the candidate. Awesome! Thank you so much. Yep. Um, seeing a lot of thank yous in the chat. Thank you for all the tips. Very informative. I learned so much. Uh, this was wonderful. So, so thank you um, so much. I don't see any other questions that have come into the chat. I even asked my cat; she doesn't have any. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think uh, we are good. Thank you so much for both of these webinars. They were absolutely amazing. And I think um, I learned a lot as a VTS and uh, hopefully everyone else did as well. Um, Lori, did you have any last uh, words that you wanted to say? Just to thank Dr. Hansen and thank you everybody else and Dr. Hansen for all your valuable information. I'm sure it came in very handy for everybody uh, writing exam and exam questions. So thank you. All right. Very good. Thank you very much for the invite. Have a great evening, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a good night. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.